What's up, Luca? How you doing, boss? So my theory on you is there's a lot of low-key legends, and I feel like you would only know the low-key legends if you're in the actual field of e-commerce, yeah. and you for sure are a low-key legend. Thank you. Like You don't really like promote yourself out there on like YouTube and all this, but you have your hand in a lot of things that people just have no idea about. And so I'm excited about this because we've like talked before, but I don't know like the whole realm and spectrum of everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And we're about to learn right now. Yes, we are. So I would like to welcome you to the, oh, that was the wrong one. The Simplified Podcast. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, what's up, Luca? Where'd you grow up? I, uh, I grew up a lot of places. We bounced around a lot growing up, but... I would say I spent the most time in Los Angeles. So at this point, it's like I'm from L.A. Why were you bouncing around so much? We just, uh, my mom's financial situation growing up wasn't that good. So we just were staying at friends' houses. So whoever was like the friend that would let us crash. Damn. And then at the time, my mom didn't, I don't know how much I can say, uh, but at the time, my mom didn't have like her green card and shit. So she just couldn't work. So we were just like, whatever home could like take us in. Oh, where was she from? France. France? Yeah. And then, so sh was she here like illegally at the time? Uh, at the time, yeah. Really? She just wanted us to grow up in America. She didn't want us to grow up in France. Just because like English speaking, the education. Yeah. She was like, yeah, you guys got to be in America. We were Americans. So, like I was born here. My brother was born here. So. So all of your family's in France? It's like a few people. It's a small family. It's okay. me, my mom, my brother, two grandma, cousin. That's it. And are they all in LA? Right. They're in France. Just they're, my mom and my brother are here. Okay, so they're still in LA. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what's she do now? Uh, she chills. She uh, she like uh, does like uh, costume uh, for like commercials and stuff. So she's like fashion. That's so, and is your brother older or younger? Older. Older. Yeah. Hell yeah. You have a brother? I got three older brothers. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It sucks being the younger one. Not necessarily. I feel like the younger people, you know, you get away with the most. True. And you learn from their mistakes too. So I guess that might be helpful. hundred percent. But I fought a lot. Did you fight a lot with your brother? Yeah. All of them. All of them. I had to fight to like get my word out, you know? For sure. When, you, when you're the youngest, a lot yeah. of, like a lot of times you just won't get heard. Yeah. Yeah. No, so my, I, mm -hmm. How old are you right now? I'm 21. 21? Yeah. Interesting. And when did you start getting involved in like... Because was it e-commerce first? Was that the first thing you got involved with the online money? So the online money was e-commerce, yeah. And so the story kind of goes, I was in high school. I got robbed. I was like trying to go to college. Like that was my thing. Uh, but I knew I wanted to get a full ride because uh, I couldn't afford it. And I knew I wasn't going to go in debt. To, like I wasn't going to go into debt to go to school because I was going to go major in business. So to me, that was like super counterproductive to like what I wanted to achieve in life. I thought like, look, like a businessman's not going to go into debt to like learn business. Like that's like totally backwards, like business 101, like no matter who you are. So I got robbed of these like three A's. I had like 88s, like, and I begged and pleaded at the end of the semester and I got robbed. And I remember waking up the next morning and I was like, dude, I just need to make money. Like, I, I don't, I don't need to be here. Like. I, I can't just keep doing the same like unproductive like my mom's struggling like my see what my brother is doing in school It just doesn't seem like a right solution for me. And so I tested out uh, Junior year and then I just started working and so I took my resume and I started like walking up and down and giving resumes and I gave it to a guy named uh, Jamie who is now like the CEO or the ex CEO of a company called ring which is like the doorbell company yeah. And so I just literally got a job with them when they had like 10 employees. And by the time I left, like a year later, they had like six, 700. So that for me was as an entrepreneur was gave me a lot of insight as to like, I literally saw a company go from, you know, $10 million raised to a billion dollars in revenue in like a year. And, you know, by the time I left, Amazon had acquired them. And so that was probably like my first like decent exposure. I was just working like a menial job at the time. And, but it was just kind of cool to be at like the ground level of a real tech startup. And then from there I started selling solar panels, uh, which is a really good sell if you own the home. Like I still advise anybody who owns a home to get some solar panels. Uh, but it was a pretty good sell. Uh, and so I was selling them over the phone, cold calling, and I was crushing that. 
until like they started playing with my commissions and just one day dude if we're being honest i just saw like a like one of these guys like yo my brother made fifteen thousand dollars a day and he's only 15 years old and i was like oh shit so i just spent the 200 bucks and bought it and like the course sucked like i didn't learn anything from that course except for two things shopify and burla and then from there i was like okay like I understand that and like to me that was like when I first learned about it that was like magic I was like oh my god you're telling me I can sell anything like at any time like to anybody like at any point so this was 2016 then so this was so I did high school junior so probably about 2015 I worked for two years literally every day five days a week seven two years straight so I know what it's like to be in the workforce. Did that for two years. And then at the end of the two years, uh, while being a salesperson, I bought that course. So I would say about, I got into e with 2020, 2017. So 2017, I started running my first couple stores, fail, f- fail, fail. And like, I remember one time I was like in my bathroom and I was like, I was crying. And it was like a weird story. But I was like, ah, I like, could, it wasn't working. Like the whole, like, I was like, dude, I'm going to quit. Like, but I couldn't quit. You know what I mean? Like there was no, I wanted to quit so bad and just like give up and do something else. But like, what else was I going to do? Like work a job, continue like this. Like to me, like this was the only saving grace. And so then I found like my first, you know, I did my little first little jewelry store. And then like, I figured out a way to like market it with influencers. And I was like, okay, like, once that started happening, like the first month we did really great. Second month, like kept on doubling revenue month over month. And then like eventually we just went parabolic and I was like, oh shit. Uh, and then like, you know, rest is history. And can you say the name of the jewelry store? Yeah, yeah, no. In the beginning, I had ended up giving the store away to uh, a good friend of mine, but it was the Gold, Cart- the Gold Cartel was the first store that we did. And, uh, that was just at the, I, what I had noticed is like, I knew all the big rap. I was like, I was like, let me get these rappers to promote my fake chains. Cause I was like, you know what I mean? But I couldn't afford them at the time. So I was reaching out to smaller pages, the fan pages, like little pump fan pages or rich, the kid fan pages who I knew had the same demographic as the big guys. Uh, but obviously I couldn't pay a hundred thousand dollars for rich, the kid to post it, but I could pay $10 for rich, the kids fan base who has the same fans as rich, the kid to post it. And so I was like spending $10, making a hundred, spending a hundred, making 500. And I was hitting at the time. A lot of people weren't doing this. Uh, and then I started like, you know, developing like, and thinking about different ways to market and different sales and things that you could do. Uh, and then I started gaining some real traction like that. So you started scaling this jewelry store up and up and up. Yeah. And then at the end of the jewelry store, I heard that you sold the pixel data. Is that true? I never sold pixel data. Really? Okay. I'm hearing. See, this is why like yeah. in the, in the econ world, I guess there are rumors. Yeah. So I'm glad you're here today to clear some things up because what I've heard from many, like multiple different people is that you sold the pixel data, Dan Folger for GLD. Damn. Yeah. I wish I would have done that. Wow. That'd, That'd be great. Hey, Dan, if you're listening to this. I've got like 20 million hits on my pixel buzz. Wow. Jewelry. Cut me a check. I can't believe that's not true. Like that's what I always thought. I would love that. Dan, cut me the check. Cause someone told me specifically you sold it to him for six figures. I would charge him seven. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't charge him six. I would charge him seven. Okay. Bro, that pixel is so, f- you see, he's done a great job with what he's like. I'm going to give credit where credit is due. I have my own little weird story with him. He wouldn't know it, uh, but yeah, he did really great with that. I didn't sell him anything. Oh, well, I'm glad we can clear that up. Yeah. So jewelry was jewelry was your first successful store. Yeah. Did you start opening like multiple stores after that? So then one thing happened. I had met uh, Supreme Patty, right, which mm. you know about. Uh, and I had we I was he was just I was paying him to promote my store, and like he like I was paying him and like dude, he was like 10 Xing the money that I was paying him. And I was like, Oh, cr- like, wow. Like this is a l- crazy. But the thing is I had developed a, ra- a relationship with Patty and Mills, which is his manager. Uh, I developed such like, we were all the same age. Like they were from the mud. Like, like they hadn't come from nothing. I had come from nothing. Like we were all the same age. I saw how they were living and I was like, look, like we can take this bigger than like, you know, me paying you for a post and like you doing this. So they came down to LA 
Uh, one thing led to another, but then I just made this, we made the Supreme patty.com store. Uh, and the rest is kind of history from there. That kind of led to me kind of diverting business models where I had this thing where I thought influencers, like if you had a million followers to me, it was mind boggling that you didn't have like a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands or, you know, millions of like, I, I thought like, okay, you had a million followers, you have a million bucks, give or take. Right came as you get into this space you realize like a lot of these guys don't have any money like they like some of these guys are like happy making four or five ten grand a month where i'm like you're thinking like dude you have so much more upside to like your business and your platform and so patty kind of really opened my eyes as to like what was possible there and so we kind of came to like a business arrangement where it was like look like what we had done with patty was like so successful that we thought why can't we do this to a bunch of people? And so then we started scaling the business that way. And then we were just opening different stores with different people. Uh, and that was kind of something that worked really well for us at the time. And what were some of the people you worked with? I mean, I've worked with like, I mean, I, I have to like think who I can say and who I'm allowed to say. Uh, but I think I'd be good to say, you know, we worked with little pump on a couple of stuff. Uh, we did Patty. Uh, I don't, uh, I just don't want to say anything that my lawyer talent would be pissed about. So right. Shout out talent. My dog, <laughs> best lawyer in the game. So, I don't want to say I, I, we sign a lot of non-disclosures and stuff. We do a lot of back end stuff for people. And so like, we don't, we let other people take credit for the things that we do. I don't care about the credit. I just care about the money. Yeah. That's, that's why I've learned from a lot of really successful people. You want to be behind the business. Yeah. You don't want to be the face of the business. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. That's why, like, like you said, you'd mentioned, I try not to be like super out there. Like I've learned from people. I mean, there's, there's definitely multiple routes. I feel like I've jeopardized my personal brand and the upside that I could, you know, a lot of people are crushing it there. And like you, so much opportunity comes that, you know, if you display like, and you like show your accomplishments and what you've done, like you can make so much opportunity to just comes migrating your way that like, I, I feel like I lose there. You know what I mean? Kind of being secluded and not telling people what I do or what I've done. Uh, but then in the same side, you know, it also kind of keeps me like out of the drama and out of some BS, you know? Right. Because a lot, an issue that I run into a lot now is that I'm so open with what I'm about, like the e-commerce thing and everything mm -hmm. on YouTube that nowadays, if I meet anybody, like say I meet a, this, this is a true story. Say I meet like multiple people at like a wedding, like my friend's wedding mm -hmm. and we're getting along and then they learn what I do. Now I'm in a very tough spot because I, I've seen this play out many times. We're going to get along. They find out what I do. And then it's drop shipping question, drop shipping question after drop shipping. How can question. you help me? Exactly. You know what I hate? I'm going to just want to take this time and say it. And everybody's situation is different, but I hate when people ask me for help and I'll tell you why nobody helped me. So like if I can do it and I'm not any smarter than anybody, I, I like I attribute my success to the fact that I was just more focused and worked hard. But like people like, dude, I was literally fulfilling drop shipping orders. I was looking at the Shopify. Look, this is how like this is how bad this was. I was taking the order and I was typing the address in like Amazon. Like I was typing it physically. Like my first like hundred and my first like three hundred orders on would, Amazon. Like I would uh, uh, Amazon AliExpress whatever was sold. Like I was just like screenshotting. I, again, there was no Burlo. I didn't know a Burlo. Like when I found out a Burlo, it was like, it solved everything. It like blew my mind. Like the one bottleneck in the business that I thought was like, Oh my God, like I'm, <laughs> I can't, this is not scalable typing in these addresses. I don't know why I didn't just Google search it. I guess like a little negligent, naive there. But I mean that, that like to me really like I knew nothing like, you know what I mean? Right. And so like, I'm obviously, I love to collaborate and, you know, obviously I have a mutual beneficial, a mutually beneficial relationship with people, but like, I hate when people ask for help, like you can ask for help. And I, and like, I love helping, but like, dude, like some people will just be like, yo, can't even, how do I open a Shopify store? It's like, man. Well, my theory on that is when they message you, Hey, can you help me start a Shopify store? Right. And I, and like I said, I've seen this thousands of times. My theory on that is the only reason they're asking that question is because deep down they know you're not going to respond to that. Right. Like they know that. 
but you not responding to it now gives them a perfect excuse for why they couldn't make it or they can't try well he never responded to me like fuck now what am i supposed to do it's just like you said no one helped me at all people will dm me asking me for money and everything right i'd like i just never was in that mental space when i needed money i moved out here and became an uber driver and you know how you were talking about how like you're like I can't quit. There's no way I can quit. Like, this is it. I was the same way, only I quit in the summer to move out here. Mm -hmm. And the same store I quit on is the exact same store I started three months later. Same product, same ad, same everything. I just learned Facebook ads through Facebook groups better, taught Mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. And that's what, that was my first successful store, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I gave up on something that was about to work. Wow. So that's what I, I love telling that to people just because like people want to give up. And they have no clue that right when they're giving up, like if, if I didn't give up, I would have never had to become an Uber driver. I would have just moved out here and be, you know, started getting into digital marketing. But right. Because I gave up, I went ahead and did that. The giving up is the, is when people DM me and stuff and they'll ask me like, look, help me or whatever. I will literally respond. Like they'll ask me like, yo, just like, give me a tip. And I literally tell them, don't give up. That's yep. it. That's the only tip I can give you. Because if you don't give up and you like get up every day and you work hard and you focus and you're determined and you're like locked in, like, okay, it might take you three months, it might take you six months, it might take you five years, but it's going to happen. You know what I mean? It's about being persistent. Like people think that like rich people are like, I, I, I might not know the notion and I don't want to speak for people, but it's like kind of like the sentiment that like, oh, like luck and like none of that is like it's hard work dude and it's just like being persistent and if you just be persistent at your craft and like what you're focused on the rest is going to fall together like so many things like are different like oh somebody told me one time i kind of got offended because like they might not have known but like you were really lucky meeting patty because obviously like i was making money uh but like patty like once we did the patty stuff like that kind of scaled me to like a whole nother realm of where like I now had the credentials and the numbers to be like, to walk into any room and be like, this is what I've done. Like, listen to me. And like the proof would back it up. But when I had, uh, what, what in that specific situation, the guy was like, you got lucky and people don't know. I had sent Patty literally like 30 emails. There was like a certain time in my life where like, I was like, I had, crashed my car a couple things and I was like digging into like my five thousand dollars that I told myself I would never touch and I at the time had an apartment and I was like young and I was like shit how am I going to figure this stuff out and like I knew I was selling clout goggles at the time on the gold cartel and I knew Patty was wearing them all the time I was like dude if this kid could you know wear these clout goggles I know they'd go crazy you know in retrospect in hindsight it did Uh, But I sent that kid 30 emails, literally 30 days straight, 30 emails. I knew that he would be the one. I just knew I had to get in contact with him. And he was, you know, at the time, a couple hundred thousand followers coming up, like they weren't checking their email. Uh, And then once we got in contact, the rest is history. But like that, that wasn't luck. Like I could have stopped after the second email. The last email I sent him, I remember it was a dissertation, dude. It was literally three pages long. It was huge. It was like breakdown. I was like, this is the potential. This is a screenshot to what I'm doing now. Like the whole, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not luck. Like, you know, it's persistence. It's resilience. It's honing in on my craft, having an objective, having a goal and working hard. Zero to a hundred million in my eyes is just hard work. You know, the rest and the billionaires and stuff, maybe they like have an extra IQ point or something, but to like get from zero to a hundred million, I really think it's hustle. It's focus. It's persistence and just being determined yeah it's consistency patience and then a huge one is not letting your ego get in the way that's that's a tough one and that's what i'm battling with to this day now a lot of the stuff that i might be talking about here i still need to apply like you know what i mean like i'm not the most focused person i'm not the most uh, like resilient person like i'm not here working on my computer 12 hours a day like i should taking it to the next level i'm constantly distracted and like you said your ego sometimes you'll You'd be like, oh yeah, you know, things are good or I'm cool or, you know, whatever, whatever. But that's a really good observation and a really good point. Well, I see it a lot in people who want to start YouTube. They're like, yeah, yeah I love to start YouTube. I'm doing this, whatever, whatever. And then they hop on YouTube. They make 10, 20 videos. They don't break one. They don't get a video that breaks like 1000 views. And then they give up because they don't like their name being attached to videos that have a couple hundred views. For me, a couple, Foolish. a couple hundred views are great. You said like, 
I get the lucky thing at time. Like you're, you're so lucky to live you do, the way you do or what you're so lucky how that one video on YouTube pop. Well, what people don't see is I started YouTube when I was 10, right? A year after it was released. And my first video was 2008. I made about 350 videos until I was about 17. Then when I was no 16, then I got a busing job so I could work two years, gave up my high school, like social life. Cause I had to work two years to um, get chest surgery because mm -hmm. my insurance wouldn't cover it. What I happened these, with your chest? I had these huge growths in my chest. They look like golf balls, literally like this. I can show you the picture later. And that, that taught me like, there's a goal, go after and get it. My parents are threatened to kick me out. If I got the surgery, all this crazy stuff was going on all while I'm like giving up the YouTube life, giving up high school, everything. But then I finally got the surgery. And I remember the, uh, to go under like what the uh, anesthesia anesthesia was 500 bucks. I, I'm, I'm, I'll save the 500 bucks. I'll just do it awake. So I did this shit awake. Like he, I, 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 this? I felt him drilling it. Like he had to do suction, like fat suction to get to it. And he had this pole literally scraped my, my breastbone and I'm awake. The only thing they gave me is like a stress ball to squeeze. And so that's what I mean by consistency. Like a lot of people never have that. I, I talked to this girl recently here. And she's like, yeah, I'm just going to college. I've never had a job before. And then we got on the, the topic of dishes. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know how anyone could ever work in the, in the restaurant industry. Like, I can't imagine rinsing off a plate. And I go, wait, have you never rinsed off a plate in your life? And she goes, no. I'm like, like what do you mean? You know, what happens with your plate? She's like, oh, I just get a maid to do it. <laughs> and so it's like, you, you got, it, it comes down to what we're talking about. You have to be the one who does it. You can't just ask for handouts. You just can't ask. And some random opportunities and come to you yeah i agree yeah people underestimate underestimate that side of things i think for sure mm -hmm. i have a question what's your uh what's your love for music over there because i know you got the studio and i was just curious i was meaning to ask you like what's what's your deal over there like are you are you like getting on the track or yeah i'm getting on the track really but I'll, do you I'll, have some records i do i got send three. me some yeah it's uh, Scotty Free on SoundCloud. Really? It's just for fun. Where that comes from, when I when I was 19, I was sophomore year at Mizzou. Uh -huh. 18, I didn't really know what I was doing. And then 19, I was like, you know, that confusing part of your life where you you leave like your parents' home and yeah. then you really start finding out who you are. Yep. Well, I met my friend Ben and he taught me a super valuable lesson. He goes, Scott, life's all about one thing, one thing only. It always comes back to keeping it real. And he was big time into freestyle rap. Right. So from that day on, I've been freestyling pretty much nonstop for like five years. And for real? Yeah. You can freestyle? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, that that will help with like your, you know, people like there's little things in life like people will underestimate like playing video games like that will improve your reaction time with things like being able to freestyle. It's like actually really difficult. And like being able to pull those words out and do that impressive so if you can really freestyle good job yeah well it's I can't. the the biggest thing i've noticed is it improves my conversational skills so much because so much when I agree with that when you have an idea in here and you can not only put it to rhymes put it to a beat but actually make it all make sense when you're having a conversation it's the same fucking thing yeah. and then that also applies like that video i filmed recently um day in life pro drop your part three i had nothing planned for that I freestyled everything in that video right? and it comes from that same thing in your brain. So that's where that comes from. I don't like, I like enjoy making it. It's fun to do. It's not something I'm pursuing, but I recognize the importance of it and it's just fun. Right. That's what it's all about. It is fun. I, one of my passions lies, like if you could ask me like, where would you make your, you know, billions of dollars anywhere? Right. Cause obviously like my goal is I one day hopefully would like to make billions of dollars. Right. If you were to ask me if I could do it anywhere, it'd be in music. I love the concept of selling records. Uh, it's something I'm really passionate about. Like music helped me a lot growing up. And then just the concept of like, okay, your song is 99 cents. Like I'm moving products all day, you know, 15, 20, $30 in the hundreds of thousands. And it's like, damn, like if I could just do that to like a record and you know, that record lives on and I get monthly residuals from that. I mean, it's a really interesting business and those guys make a lot of money. Like, you know, the guys in the back, I've learned one of my approaches. I was trying to go to major record labels and partner with them on some ventures. Uh, and that really opened my eyes to like really the business and loot and, and how lucrative it is and how much money they really make. So 
hopefully one day I can get in the music space. But right now, if it's not broken, I shouldn't fix it. So just keep doing the commerce. But you're you're kind of in the music space right now, correct? A little, yeah. Can you give me some details on that? I work with a lot of artists, right? So a lot of artists come to me. Uh, if it's like, yo, I'm trying to help move record sales and stuff like that. And I'll work with them. I only kind of choose who I work with. Like I won't work with like lower people that much. I also work with a guy named Santana Ali. He's like one of my best friends and the kid is incredibly talented. And I really think like I've known him since I was like 15, but I really think that kid is special. And I think one day very soon we'll be hearing a lot about Santana. And so he's kind of my music focus when it comes in betting people into the people that I know in the industry and, you know, artist wise. And then when it comes to just working with industry people, it's just like, yo, how can I help whatever you're doing make better? What I wanted to like tell and like work with a lot of these artists on is like these guys need to be making brands. Like they're so like focused on all these other things, but like you don't understand, like if you can just, you know, get a brand to make 10, 15, 20 million bucks with these artists are doing all day long with just menial stuff or getting paid to promote other people's stuff. I'm trying to bring the power back to them uh, and kind of build something, you know, with the infrastructure that we have on the marketing end and, you know, the back end stuff and kind of come in and try to provide something that's, you know, bigger than what they're doing musically. What do you think the best way to monetize their position in the music industry is more than more so than just the the music more so than the music it, it's building a brand wh whatever it may be whether you know i'm i'm a dis not a disbeliever uh i'm not a huge fan of them making clothes like clothes are cool but everybody does it so i try to like come in and do something different uh whether it's like a a, a cereal or a chain or or just something different you know what i mean and so I mean, we'll do the clothes like this is that, you know what I mean? Uh, and then the hat, you know, that's how I try to incorporate them there. You know, now that we're doing the Von Dutch stuff, I uh, have them come in and, you know, collaborate with Von Dutch and, you know, the unhappy with the hoodie. We'll, we'll do stuff like that. But I really think, I mean, especially with the women, there's more products for women, you know, when it comes to the makeup. Mm. And it's a really interesting space. And I feel like people are not really exploiting it the way that it should be. Uh, and so I'm trying to come in and fix that. Yeah. So tell me about the Von Dutch and the unhappy because you are the owner of unhappy, correct? I'm one of the owners. Of one unhappy. of the owners. So I like to do things. I'm a, when it comes to like, I can't be the CEO of all these businesses, right? Like I, I like, I have like a list on my phone of like all the things I have like equity in or I'm partners in. And it's a lot and it's honestly too much. And I'm working to like, <laughs> figure out which projects are really the projects that are worth my time and like focus and energy. But I'm like a huge believer in a team. Like I don't want to do all the work for one project. Like I know what I'm good at. Like I'm good at making sales and driving traffic and getting people to see it. Like that's what I'm good at. And so like when it comes something to a clothing brand like this, it's like, dude, I'm not a designer. Like I can't sit there on Photoshop and do that stuff. Like there's certain avenues and certain people I can't get it on. And so I have to be strategic. Like people have to be brought on with unhappy specifically. Uh, you know, there was a lot of assets involved with the website, the domain and, uh, but unhappy is something that, yeah, there's a, there's a three other people involved with it. And so shout out Peter who's designing this stuff. Yeah, he, the the drawstrings are like I've never seen that before on a clothing brand ever. That's like the big appeal to me is like seeing that it kind of looks like a bust down drawstring. Dude, it's a bust down drawstring, and the craziest thing is when you see this next collection, this guy's cooked up, dude. The one he's pioneered the drawstrings. Yeah, I'm giving him the credit where yeah. credit is due. Peter, you did this. Kudos to you, Buzz. But the next stuff that we're dropping, bro, you're gonna geek. Dude, the drawstrings that we have, like the whole collection next time is crazy. How big is the collection? It's about three hoodies, two pants, denim. But we're doing like some cuttings. We're like doing like embroidery on the denim. Like you'll see, but it's crazy. I'm going to get you some stuff. Awesome. And so the Von Dutch stuff is thanks to this guy over. Can't see him. Benjamin, what's up, Ben? Mm -hmm. Shout out the Balminator. 
uh, that's my guy. I mean, uh, he basically kind of facilitated that whole thing. And so I thought these guys were doing millions of dollars a year online. I would just think, I mean, it's Von Dutch, right. you know what I mean? And they were doing well. And I, I just thought like, okay, like they make money on like their point of sale. Cause they have a couple retailers and stuff like that. But we came in to kind of just take it to the next level. And so our objective there is just make it the Von Dutch that it was back in like 2002, 2003, which if you remember, like, dude, everybody was wearing that stuff. And slowly but surely that we've been doing this for about the last two, three months. But I mean, I'll give Pat ourselves on the back, but it's kind of crushing it. And so like we've successfully gotten it on a bunch of people and, and it's great to work with a brand that's been around for like 60 years, you know, that has so much like clout and legitimacy in the business that it's just like, it really shows what we're capable of doing because like all I need is a good product and I know I can do the rest. Do you know what I mean? Of course. And so with the Von Dutch stuff, when you guys see it in six months and it's the biggest brand, just remember it was Ben and Luca. How did that connection even start? Like, how did you get in contact with Von Dutch? Dude, this guy to the right of us is a G. <laughs> he just knows. He just, dude, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, I mean, Ben could speak on it better than I, but dude is just, uh, you, you come in somewhere and you see if some, if somebody's lacking something and if you can provide the solution, provide the solution. So, I mean, Ben just was talking to one of the head guys over there and they just, you know, the numbers were not what I thought it would, you know, should be on the online side. And so he did the rest. He was like, dude, we can come in and create a solution. And, you know, our Rolodex of the people that we work with falls hand in hand with something like this. And so it was just kind of a one, two, I mean, he's the closer. So he closed that and it's a, it's, I just think it's cool just for the culture. Like I don't also like to do when I sell stuff online and like things that I do, I'm not that guy that's just like, Oh, making a dishwasher and like throwing it on a store and like, yo, or like some crazy pods or like some like watch crazy smart watch and like just run the Facebook ads and hit the Google and just like, whew, and like money, like some guys do that. And like, that's awesome. Like kudos to you. I'm really only good and I've only found, I've tried doing that and like that stuff's been great. But the things that I found real success in are things that are one culturally intertwined, like things that have to do with like what's going on in the now, as well as like things that I like and things that like I like would buy or like be a part of. Like I can't sit there and sell some shit that like I have like no intrigue like for like if i like don't like it or it doesn't like it's not something that like equates to me like uh like i can't get passionate about that like i know dudes making like our kids our age like making millions of dollars a month bro pushing products that like they have like like makeup and their guys like shout out hans my dog he's crushing but like i'm like dude like dang like you got some resilience there i mean the money's so good that like they've cracked the code so like keep doing it but it's like, wow, like I wish I could muster the energy to do some makeup because like the margin that are crazy. It's just like, how can I get passionate about something that like I just don't use or know about? I'm trying to get over that. You know what I mean? But maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't. That's pretty much the exact crossroads I've been at lately. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I'll get messages from people being like, hey, you know, thank you so much. I've made this amount of money. It's like, it's cool seeing those messages. But what I've realized recently, especially with making these YouTube videos, is I get more joy out of someone saying, you had me dying laughing right. than you made me this amount of money. Right. And so I, I've been thinking about that a lot. So it's funny you bring that up. It's like, which way do I go? Do I go where it's like, you know, helping people make money, 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 or like joy and bringing joy to someone else brings joy to myself. And that's, and that's interesting. You bring that up and I'll let people know, right? I thought a million, like I'm, I'm a thinker. I sit and think a lot. I'm a homebody. Like I asked my dogs, like really Ben's the only person who can really get me out of the house right now. But like, I really thought money, like when I was broke, like poor, I was like, dude, a million dollars is going to change my life. Like, dude, if I just had a million dollars, I would just be on like life would be great. And a million dollars later, it's like, 
I had like a little moment six months ago where I really was not in a good spot. Just mentally, I felt like depressed. And I was like, why do I feel depressed? It's because the goalpost kept moving, right? So I hit a million, you know, you make a million dollars and then you're like, okay, like it's $5 million now and then $10 million. And then I can only imagine once that I hit those milestones and those goals, it's like, okay, like $30 million, $100 million. And it kind of depressed me for a while because it's like shit. Like I remember thinking like, dude, a million dollars, like how ecstatic would I be if I had that? And then once I got that, I was like, oh, like, hmm. Like, okay, your lifestyle changes. You're not worried about like, okay, what kind of food you're going to eat? Like, obviously certain problems that are like really tough when you're poor are like not the same problems that like are going on now. But then it's like more stress, bro, more bills, more things to pay, like more people looking to you for help or expectations from your friends. And so like it can be overwhelming. It can be a lot. People don't, people don't underestimate, like don't understand that as much. I mean, obviously people who've been successful do. But I do have a motto. Money, obviously, now I can tell you that I know it's not everything. Like, there's so much more to life and being happy than money. But I still stand by this. If you don't have any money, minus, like, again, people are different. But I just can't imagine working eight hours a day and nine to five and then saying money isn't important or isn't everything when I'm dedicating eight to nine, ten hours of my day slaving away for money you know what i mean like you got to have money to realize money isn't everything but like the some people will be like you know living in a freaking shoe box like oh, money isn't everything and like okay like i understand that and some people like you know the in the wild guy like you know guys can just go out and live on the like kudos to you i got mad respect for it i wish i could do that but it's like you can't to me you can't just work you can't be miserable working a job every single day and then tell yourself look money isn't everything because like if I'm looking at your life and the time that you're awake and like functioning, if you're working half the time, like a job that like you not necessarily enjoy for the paycheck, then I would, I would assume that money is everything in your life right now. And you need to fix whatever issue that is to really get to the next step. I feel like financial freedom is important for people like life. I know this really well. I worked for two years, bro. You know what I mean? Like legit five days a week, hustling, grinding, no friends. Like people like people who really know me know, bro. Like Eric, you might know, bro. I disappeared. Like you did not find me. Like, no, no. My best friends, bro. I cut off my best friends because our priorities weren't aligned. And I knew I just had to be where I needed to be. And so like you have to be willing to make those sacrifices this whole pulling up and like hanging out with your like if you're not doing stuff if you're not being productive like I understand living your life and being fr free and all that stuff but like dude you've got a the 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 abyss that not having money can put you in is a really tough one you know what I mean at the end of the day like I can get my I can pull myself out of a depression I can pull myself out of a bad day because like I I, I humble myself. I realize, like, dude, life could be way worse for me right now. Uh, and so that stuff really helps. But I can only imagine for people that can't say that. Like, you know what I mean? That type of, like, success has helped me also from, like, really going over the edge and going over the border. And the fact that I could be, like, look, like, be grateful, be humble. Like, this stuff, like, help, you know, I don't know. These these two hats are for you, yeah, by the way. Thank you very much. Because I actually saw a little Uzi wear this one in the first video he did with a rock star life. Yeah. So I really like this hat for sure. I'm going to switch it out right now. Yes, sir. So when you said going from not having money to having money, what do you think the biggest difference has been? Because I have my own theory on this. I want to hear yours first, but it's definitely not even close to what I was expecting would be the biggest difference. I mean, the biggest difference, I, I would say the biggest difference <laughs> It's a funny one <laughs> is the food. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, man. Cause when I was broke, bro, I was literally eating McDonald's. Like I had a thing, like I had a $5, I had a $5 budget for, cause for me going to work and making $15 an hour, I would be freaking crazy. And people disagree with me all day. Like I know plenty of people are going to listen to this and be like, you're nuts, dude. But I was like, dude, if I'm spending any more than $5 a day on lunch, like, dude, I'm only making $80 in the day. So if you're telling me I'm spending like $15, $20 of my paycheck that I just spent the whole day on, on my lunch, 
like you were bananas. You know what I mean? I was in stack or starve, bro. I was working. I was living at my mom's house. I was like, yo, I'm going to work and save all this money. So I had a $5 budget for food. And so like now I don't even think about like money for food. Right. But the food is something that changed. I guess the girls kind of the girls we live in Island from LA. So like a lot of these girls are materialistic and like, dude, girls, I mean, I wouldn't say girls wouldn't look at me, but it's like, yo, like the girl that I wanted, like, you know what I mean? The girl that you want, like knows her worth, knows her value. Like, you know, in this city, like she knows that she's that girl. So she's going to go with the Scott Hillsey in the Hollywood Hills home. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's not going to go with skater Luca with ripped <laughs> shoes, ripped hoodie, you know? Mm -hmm. So the girls changed a little bit, but I wouldn't say I didn't have a problem getting girls before, but like, like being content with like the girls that, yeah. yeah. What about you? What's, what would your, the thing that surprised me the most is <clears throat> I felt like I'm the same person for the two years. Yeah. I mean, I buy different things. I might right. wear different things, but I've always stayed true to who I am. I'm never going to be the suit and tie guy who like, you know, you see a lot of people who really don't know what they're talking about, get a little success. And then all of a sudden they're talking like this as if they hold all the secrets to the world and, and they start like acting different, like all <laughs> sorts of weird things. But I was very, from the beginning, like I said, when I met Ben, he said, it all goes back to just keeping it real. Always, no matter what, keep it real. So when I finally started having success, I started realizing the main difference in my life is people's perspective on me. Therefore, when I say certain things, their perspective of is different. Like, for example, if I'm at my friend's house and I go and we get an ad on YouTube, I'm like, oh, you don't have the YouTube red. Mm -hmm. I would have said that when I had like ten dollars in my account. Right. But now that I'm saying it now, they kind of take it as like, well, we don't have as much as money you, Scott. Or I remember a long time ago, this girl was coming to my house and it was like 105 degrees and she was driving with the oh. windows down. She's like, oh, I just drove all the way here and the AC was broken. Oh, I'm just so sweaty. And I go, oh, um, no, no, she didn't say the AC was broken. She said, I'm just so sorry. I had the windows down. And I'm like, why don't you just use the AC? And she goes, my AC is broken. I don't have an I-8 like you, Scott. So I get a lot of that too. Right. Where it's like an instant comparison thing. And that's why I got out of the designer clothing. Like I fell down a rat hole with that. <sighs> you fall down that rat hole so quick. That's a waste of money. Huge waste of money. And I still fall for it to this day. Mm -hmm. Such a waste of money, dude it's the biggest waste of money. And then it, it, you, you kind of offer up like a perspective on someone who doesn't, who has never met you. If they never met you and you are wearing like Gucci, everything, Louis Vuitton, Balenciaga, they're going to look at you differently. Dude, I have a crazy story. I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I'll take I, as much time as you I want. think this is worth saying. I'm not going to say who, cause I'm not going to be a cheese ball and be like, yo, but like, let's just say it's the like creme de la creme of like celebrities. Right. Mm hmm. We were, oh my bad. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, right when Patty, Patty moved, we moved in the house in LA. It was the first, first of many lawsuits we got into for our homes, but we moved into a house in LA and he was like, yo, go, we're going to this one girl's house. Who's like, again, like one of the biggest in the world in like terms of like followers and shit like that. And I was like sick. I pulled up regular degler e-com dude, just the back end guy, you know? But like we're the we're young dude we're just we were, we had a great time there was like a good year bro where living with Patty like whoa we had a blast, uh, but we went to this house and nobody paid me any mind and like we got basketball players there we've got super like celebrities like I'm just like okay in the corner no one's talking to me, I felt like I kind of started observing like I'm an observer, and I felt like I was out of place. Because like I didn't look the part. I just that, that's what I derived from that day. I literally go home and I spend like five grand on clothes, right? Gucci out the whole nine. A few days later, we go back to the house. I'm fresh. Like I'm telling you, I'm like the freshest I've ever been in my life. What's your name, dude? Like, how are you doing? Like, what do you do? Like, you know what I mean? And that was like a huge aha moment. You see, for me. I really like genuinely to like the core of my body and like the core of my soul, like this whole materialistic, like penis size contest that everybody has, like is not really like what like 
motivates me or it doesn't really fall into my values or my ethics. But unfortunately, in the business that I'm in specifically, in the town that I live in, like it's really hard for people, at least on first impressions, to really give you the chance if you don't look the part. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a restaurant because I had an iced out watch or was had a certain pair of shoes on that somebody made a certain comment that led to a certain relationship that made me hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's happened a couple times, freakishly enough. And so it's a it's kind of a battle in this city specifically, but I with that stuff and I tell myself all the time, like, yo, I need to be buying assets. Like, you know what I mean? Dude, that Gucci shirt that you just spent $500 for is now worth $50 on eBay the second you decide to liquidate. And like, dude, that stuff sucks. But then you also got to quantify it in certain situations where it's like, oh, you know. So I try to do in the watches. Watches for me are like my guilty pleasures because watch watches appreciate. You know, obviously not necessarily as much as the diamond ones. The diamond ones depreciate. But like, I like watches and I have like a watch collection. And so like that to me is like where I try to spend my money or shoes because, mm-hmm. you know, we have the shoe store now too. Right. Cookies and kicks, right? Yeah. Shout out cookies and kicks. Best shoe store in Los Angeles. If you get your shoes from anywhere else, we're not cool. Do, do you have a certain way to like write off your diamond watches and jewelry? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, and, and it's like, dude, I, I have my, all my watches up for sale on a website on a Shopify Anytime you can go and buy it. I mean, to me, it's inventory. Mm. So you can derive what you want out of that. But it's inventory, dude. I'm selling that stuff. Yeah. Moving money. And the thing is about watches, they appreciate, bro. Like I have, I just sold uh, like a double quick presidential gold. I made like four grand on it about it a year ago. Yeah, It's like little things like that. People don't understand. Like there's little things you can do, like putting your money in a wealth front account or like downloading acorns or like, you know, Robin hood and like me and you've been talking about, like you have to make your money work for you. Like one thing that I'm really like against now is a big available cash balance. Like I'm not into big, that stuff anymore. Like I used to be like, okay, let's stack the Wells Fargo account. But like, what does that do? Like you take that against inflation and everything. And it's like, bro, you're losing money every year. You just don't know it. You know what I mean? So now all my money is in a wealth front, which gives you 2% a year just for having your money sit there because the banks make money on your money, right? Mm-hmm. So now tech startups are coming up, wealth front, the biggest one, uh, and they're basically just letting you like, you know, put your money in there and they'll give you the interest that they make on your money, you know, minus some because they still have, they're still a bank. They still have to make money on your money, but they'll get, they'll let you reap the rewards of what they do as a bank. Yeah. Uh, so now it's like, okay, I'm making 2% on that. You have the acorn stuff, which is like, dude, so dude, I literally forgot about my acorns for two years and I pulled it up about six months ago and I had like 60 G's in there. Jeez. I was blown away. I was like, okay, like, thank God for acorns. You know what I mean? It's just little stuff like that. Like it's, it's a two way thing, right? You you also have to make money. You have to make sure that like you're in good standing with the IRS, the whole nine, but your money has to be making you money. I'm a huge stock guy, huge, you know, any type of investment, whether it's real estate, whether it's a rental property, whether it's a Bitcoin or a Tesla or a, you know, Goldman Sachs, whatever it may be. I'm a huge, huge avid believer in making your money work for you. And I'll be honest with you. If like I did the math, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not, it's too much of an accountant like hurdle to really do it. But I would argue I've probably made close to as much money trading and just doing stocks and like investment stuff than I have on the e-com side. And I'm not like a guy who sits on Forex all day for five hours a day, you know, doing technical analysis. Like I told you when we're sitting at the pool, like, dude, I'm, I'm just investing in things that I like and things that make sense, things that I'm seeing every day, like reading articles, reading news, watching, you know, I watch news a lot. Bloomberg, like the markets, like just listening. Like I'm not over here breaking my back over a computer doing trades. I'm just investing in like viable, smart investments that mm-hmm. just make sense. And you said something interesting to me the other day. So you wake up around like 6 a.m., right? Yeah, 6. So you don't necessarily like sit there and trade for five hours, but what you like to do is sit there and watch the stocks. Just look, look at them. I'm going to give you guys free game. Ready for this? Let's hear it. Twitter is the most powerful social media platform. Why is that? It's not even close because all the big tech guys 
all the real smart people in the world are on Twitter. And people underestimate Twitter, bro. I wake up at 6 a.m., you know what I do? I scratch my eyes. I take a deep breath. <laughs> and I uh, uh, and I just go on Twitter. And I just read what these guys are tweeting about, dude. Why this guy is doing this. This guy is doing a trade here. They're, they're doing it all for you. Like if you, it's about following the right people. Like you got to follow the right people. I have like this fake like ringer account where I'm like Harvard. Like it's so funny. My bio is like Harvard trader. Like, you know what I mean? So I'll just read posts and I'll, and I'll like talk back. Dude, Twitter is, I've been on that thing for six, seven years. It's my secret weapon. People think I'm like a goat or something. Nah, dude, I'm giving you game. It's Twitter. So most of your trade knowledge is coming from Twitter. It's not necessarily coming from Twitter. It gives me a real good idea of the markets. Like I feel like I have a good finger on the pulse when I'm on Twitter. Like when somebody like when some guy who owns like a $10 billion hedge fund thinks that like Tesla is massively undervalued and like, you know, is giving you a full like historical report, you know, that I just click on and I would now read his work and research for a good 20 minutes. I'm now understanding that this stock is now incredibly undervalued right and then i'm looking at elon i'm seeing you 25 million followers you're getting freaking 100k retweets on everything that you're doing you're one of the great genius minds of our lifetime you know what i mean and you have a product that everyone loves and you're spending zero on marketing so when you're at an all-time low at 180 dollars, i'm going all in you bet your mom i'm going all in and that's that's what i learned the hard way it's like you were saying, you don't want your cash to just sit there. I just talked to no. my friend Jeremy. He said the average accredited investor has 13% cash, like 50% real estate, like 30% stocks. He broke it down for yep. me. And my big regret is thinking back a year ago when I bought my car. My, I, Like I said, I grew up and we didn't own a car over like $5,000. Yep. So my parents always said, you know, always buy your car in cash. You don't want to pay the interest. <laughs> Well, they weren't accounting for like an $80,000 car. For sure. So I bought that in cash. Oh, and, nice, dude. And, Good and job. I, and I look at like if I would have put that in stock. So say I got that loan for 80000 putting no cash down, 5% APR. If I would have taken that eighty grand and say put forty in Tesla, forty in Shopify, I would have made about a quarter million, $300,000 off of that. And it was all because. This is, this is real facts too. Yeah. You really would have. Exactly. I, and, and I, and I was so knowledgeable, like even my friend said, Hey, listen, don't tell anybody, but Shopify is about to start fulfilling. They're about to do f open up their fulfillment center, buy stock. Now is at 180, and Tesla was at like 210. It was right before the drop. So it's like, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Shopify is now at 550, I 550. think. And Tesla is well over 900, but I chose to buy a car instead of making the money work for me. I bought depreciation as a uh, liability rather than an appreciation asset. Oh, for sure. Yeah, dude. It's it's so many things I could tell you like that. I mean, it's it's about learning. People need to understand that when you when you do things like that, it's okay to do them and I embrace problems and fires. I call them fires. <laughs> like we got fires going on all the time. This is like basically bullshit. Uh I I embrace that stuff, but you have to learn the lesson. You have to know that the next time you have 100 Gs and you're at the BMW dealership that you know, you should probably either finance it or, you know what I mean, make another decision that's smarter. Yeah. It's about making, it's about learning and not repeating the same mistakes. Definitely. So. It was like one of those things I just felt like, I want to do this so bad because three years ago, my car was a 1998 Honda Civic. And I remember being so embarrassed because every parking lot I, I went to, I had the worst car. I had the worst. worst car. And all of a sudden, now I have the best car, and I'm getting way too much attention. Right. Especially in Missouri. Right. Every single time I went to the gas station, three conversations minimum. Every single time. And I started hating that so much. So it's, it's just so weird how, like, your perspective can change on things. Because now at this point, I could care less about, you know, at this point, buying an extravagant car. All I want is, like, probably just, like, a reliable Tesla. Right. Something it's kind of just like having an iPhone where it's like you don't have to worry about before the iPhone people were selling thirty five thousand dollar gold plated blackberries and like all these different models and then they just simplified it because now that's one less decision you gotta think about or even have on your mind. It's just like the clothing, like Steve Jobs wearing the same outfit. Like when I went through my designer phase, 
not only would I spend like sometimes 30 minutes, an hour deciding what am I going to wear today, but I would also like spend so much time looking for the stuff to buy too. So much time and time is the most valuable thing. Time is the most valuable thing you have, dude. So wherever, what does it say? That wherever the energy goes, the energy flows or something like that. Yeah. You're talking about energy. You guys want to know something crazy about this guy? <laughs> and I, I don't believe it. So I got to see it. But apparently wherever he goes, lights will like flicker and turn off. I, yeah, I've been advised not to talk about that too oh, much really? anymore. Did I screw up? No, no, no. You're good. I'll, like oh. I, I've obviously posted about it a bunch, but I recently met someone who also has it. And this guy's like in the billions. And he said, listen, you probably shouldn't be talking about that Why? Like, publicly anymore. Just because he's like, he's like been through it himself. He's like, then they're going to, them whoever you? wants to stick and prod you and like test you. And, and then you're going to get into a lot of things you rather not, rather than just focusing down on your own knowledge of it. The feds? The feds? Could be, who knows? The Illuminati. <laughs> But this guy was coming from Smell a very, bones. very powerful like spot. And he's like, listen, you probably, cause I'm not going to make that documentary. I don't think any more about it. Yeah. But it definitely, it on the low. definitely happens a lot. A little too much. Where were you born? St. Louis. But here's my, I do have one theory on it though. Okay. There, there's like lots of theories. Anyone can Google it. Slider energy. One theory though is electromagnetism comes from lightning. Like mm -hmm. a lot of it. Mm-hmm. When a while ago, before my grandpa died when I was like six, but this is his chain. I've been wearing it for almost 10 years, but he got struck by lightning. I'm not sure when, but if he was wearing this chain, it would make sense that this chain could have been electromagnetic, electromagnetically charged. And then after it started happening to me when I dropped out of college specifically, it could have taken like a couple of years to charge my body up. It's kind of like if you take a piece of metal and a magnet, that metal becomes magnetized. If you keep putting the magnet to it. Makes sense. So it's possible that it altered my electromagnetism, electromagnetic output. And then as I'm wearing it more and more, it's getting larger and larger because it's, it's only gotten more consistent the past couple of years. Wow, dude. You're like a superhero. His new name, his new name is Magnet Man. Or no. <laughs> We're calling him uh, Electrolyte. <laughs> You're Electrolyte. With a G or a T. A G. G. G H T. That's pretty cool, dude. Yeah. I, I come up with good names like my car, the Green Goblin. Mm -hmm. uh, Beverly Hills Bandit. Like, come on, bro. Somebody in Hollywood should hire me. How did that start? Because the first time I heard you reference yourself as the Beverly Hills Bandit, you got arrested for like going 170 on the way back from Coachella. It was 150. And this is a funny story, dude. I'm flying back from Coachella. Why? I don't know. I think I was just like in a good mood. It was a bad Coachella. It was like a boring Coachella. Uh, but dude, we're just flying on the highway, just listening, jamming to music, flying, bro, going like cruising at 130. I start going like 150, like 160. And these cop. I know, I remember this. And I was like, we passed these cops and I was just flying. I was like, they're gone. 20 minutes go by. I'm still... The cops turn off the lights, hit the left hand shoulder, and they told me when they pulled me over, they're like, Well, we've been following you going 130 for the last 20 minutes. Like, what's going on? So when I they pulled me over, I was like, dude, how do we get out of this? And I told him I was marshmallow. And I was coming back. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a real story, bro. Bro, this fool Peter. I'm like, yo, Peter, how do we get out of this, dog? And I was like, dude, they're throwing me in jail. 150, bro? That's a that's a felony like yeah. I, like that's like real endangerment bro if i clip anybody we're all dead like my mom is probably flipping out listen like <laughs> listening to this but we're all dead and she knows uh and duty pulls me over and i'll get out and he's like you know it's like what's what's going through your mind and i'm like dude i just finished a set at coachella i have to perform at this club in la called nightingale and I literally have an hour and a half to make my show officer. I'm so sorry. Like I would never do it again. They're like, who are I? I was like, look, like I don't just keep this between you and I, like I keep my, my profile really low key, but I'm like marshmallow dude. And he's like, Oh wow. Like I think God didn't ask me for like a signature or anything. Cause God damn, I would have flew that one. <laughs> but he knew who marshmallow was. Yeah. He knew okay, who marshmallow okay. was. So I was like, okay. He's like, dude. Yeah. Cause you know, bro, was green car, you know, green goblin, <laughs> young dude. Like I thought, like I played it off, bro, and bam, he fell for it. So I'm marshmallow in these streets. You didn't get arrested that day? No, dude. Let me go. 
I had a fucking per- oh, sorry. I had a performance at Nightingale, bro. Are you gonna stop Marshmallow from going from Coachella to Nightingale? You'd be the worst cop of the year. He well, would never do that. Yeah, not only was that a felony going that fast, but I feel like they would also lock you for a high speed pursuit for a while. They would have locked me up dude. easily. There was there was no getting out of that. That was the one situation that I that like that was the one excuse I could have given that I think could have got me out of that. And I think like who doesn't have a face? I was like, oh, Dead Mouse, Daft Punk, or Marshmallow. I was like, Marshmallow's the young gun right now. Who do you think Marshmallow actually is? I mean, super easy to find that one out. Not t- it's not Tiet- Tietzo, right? That was all a public like thing. No, no. We'll talk about it after the podcast. Okay. I Googled it once. I couldn't find it. No. When I show you, you're going to be blown away. You're going to be like, oh, <laughs> I was right in my face. <laughs> I bet it's another artist. If I yeah. I mean, yeah, technically it is. Yeah. It's kind of like that uh, theory that Post Malone is actually Justin Bieber. Have you heard of that? That's a retarded theory. <laughs> you never seen that? No. Oh, look, this will blow your mind sometime. If you slow down, uh, if you speed up Post Malone's tracks, sounds exactly like Justin Bieber. And if you slow down... Justin Bieber's tracks sounds exactly like Post Malone, like two, like it doesn't sound even like, like, oh, they sound kind of similar. It sounds like the same person. Have you done that on that thing? Have you slowed it down on that? No, there's just a bunch of YouTube videos <laughs> really? about it. We got to look that up in the car. Yeah. Check it out and see if Post, no, I doubt it though. It'll blow your mind for sure. Really? Yeah. No. Yeah, I would, I would link it up right now, but I have a feeling that they're going to demonetize me. No, we can't have that. We need you to make money off this video. Exactly. Million views, like, and subscribe. Million views. And comment. Yeah. Nothing negative. Like, I don't know why people comment negative stuff, man. Like, what's the point? Like, why emit that negative energy? You know what we used to do when we were younger? And this is, like, stupid stuff. But, like, when we were 15, like, we used to hang back of, like, you know, the homie's mom's car while he's, like, driving to, like, a party. Like, oh, yeah, you, you're you ugly. Like, you scream out the window, yeah, you're ugly. And, like, you know, and it's, like, shit you would do when you're, like, 15. And it's, like, dude, thinking back at it, it's, like, wow. Like, all that negative energy, no go. Some people never it does nothing for anybody. My, my perspective on it is that the only reason they do that is because say like who's uh, like for example i'm trying to think of like a good example like any artist basically and people are commenting negative things when people come to this artist profile and they, maybe they see the bust down watches and the designer clothes and everything they start to feel inferior and they, no one likes feeling inferior so the only reason that they'll comment that is because now they feel little superior because of like they're talking down to them a little right. bit it's kind of like an insecurity thing and that's why when like so so bam margera you, you know bam margera right i don't know if you're paying attention when he had his instagram breakdown yeah i'm watching every video and every video is getting millions of views and all of his photos like getting hundreds of thousands of like which is way more than he usually gets and it, a lot of the comments were hate, 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 hate. It's because these people grew up their entire lives watching him on Viva La Bam, CKY, Pro Skater, hanging out with Tony Hawk. And now he's like having his moment and everyone's attacking him. Now they're ch- now is their legit chance to feel superior. So to add like the 15,000th negative comment, now they're just get they're just milking him for a little juice of that for sure. s- superiority, like fucking juice. I feel it. I have a question for you just for all the people listening, but if you were to give one piece of advice for these kids, just like 15, 16 year old Luca, what would you give him? What would you tell him? Uh, I would say never listen to anyone who's never done whatever it is you're trying to do because you will end up not doing it just like them. When I was growing up, like I'll tell you the first day that Eric, (laughs) that's my life motto. That's my life motto. I actually have it right there to put it on a t-shirt somewhere. Put yeah, that, see, put make, that on the T, bro. Make, Unhappy make collab. signature saying T-shirt right there. Wow. Yep. Those to-do lists are crucial. Oh yeah, I see that every single day, and I'm about to I'm about to finish my February. But uh, to to expand on that, the reason I came up with that conclusion is when I started digital marketing early 2018. Again, I'm a busser at two restaurants. Mm-hmm. Dropped out of college. I thought it was gonna be a real estate realtor, but that didn't go through. I remember Ty Lopez and started his digital marketing agency. And at the time I had 1800 in my account, which I thought was so much. And I remember that came up and I said, there's something to that. Like, I think I could be good at that. And then I, I talked to my mom about it and my parents and they're like, you know, you're for, you'll for sure fail at that. You shouldn't even try. You should just go back to college. But then I thought these people have never started. They don't know anything about Facebook. They don't know anything about digital marketing strategy. 
So why would I ever trust their opinion? Boom, bought the course the next day. And then just that I didn't learn drop shipping from it, right. but the knowledge of it led to me where I am now. If I would have listened to ever, like my friends were saying, it was a stupid move. Just all these people were telling me what not to do when they haven't done it themselves. It's just like in Grant Cardone's book, he goes, you know, it's amazing. When I moved to California, everyone in my hometown was saying, you're, you're going to spend way too much money. It's too expensive. And there's a lot of weirdos out there. And he said, keep in mind, this is coming from people who have never even been to California to visit. Right. And they're saying this stuff. And I see that a lot. Like when someone wants to be an actor or a musician, they listen to their parents or like their guidance counselor's advice saying, listen, I think you should choose a more logical approach. Now, if you want to actually make it in those, you got to find an actor who's willing to talk to you, who's already done it. And a musician who's, who's willing to talk to you, who's already done it. And not, and for God's sakes, you don't want to DM them and say, can you mentor me? You right. want to establish that legit legit connection and then listen to every single thing that they tell you everything and do it even if it doesn't make sense agreed that's my number one how about you if you were to tell 16 year old scott prepare yourself and i mean that and that's applicable even to us now and that is envision who you want to be the question is, is like for me growing up, I knew I was going to be rich. I just knew it, dude. I knew I, I'm too high maintenance, bro. Like I knew I needed to like live a certain type of way. I just didn't know how, right? That's just always the mystery question. Like how, right? How are you going to make millions of dollars, right? And the how is going to come and the how always comes, but it's about having the right skill set in your arsenal so that when you figure out how you're going to make millions of dollars, you're prepared to do so. And I mean this in multiple facets. I mean that financially, right? If you're, you know, a young kid, save up your money, dude. Stack, not ten, not thousand dollars, not five thousand, like as much as you can, like possibly, right? Because when that idea comes, like you need some liquidity. When I first started drop shipping, if I didn't have that five thousand dollars in my shoebox, like I wouldn't have been able to take the risk. I wouldn't have been able to quit my job. Like I had no, you know what I mean? So that helped me, right? Once I started becoming successful, one of the things I really attribute my success to is how I can speak to people, right? Like one of the things, like when I was starting, I just knew I saw saw all these entrepreneurs, all these really successful people, like just, you know, speaking really well. And I knew like I needed to get my vocabulary up. I need to be able to have, I need to be able to sound like the person I wanted to sound like, right? I knew I needed to focus. I knew I needed to be able to how to focus. Like I, I couldn't focus. So I was like, I would train myself to do little things. Like if I can't focus for 30 minutes and do this, attribute good habits, right? And so that when the how comes, right? you're there. Like, and even now, like somebody like you or I, like, where do you want to be in 10 years? Where do I want to be in 10 years? What things can I do now to put myself in a position so that 10 years from now I can execute the things that I want to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And thus preparation because how, like, I don't know how I'm going to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars one day. I didn't know how I was going to be a millionaire though too. You know what I mean? It will come right. You know, the universe works in very mysterious ways and the law of attraction is something i really really believe in like if you want it and you're going for it it's going to come to you but you have to be prepared because if it comes and that opportunity is there and you don't know how to focus and you're sitting at a meeting and you speak like a muppet and like no one's taking you seriously and you you can't hold your own and you're not somebody that can actually have the doesn't have the wherewithal to sit there for four hours and stare at the computer because you're just like so used to doing 20 different things you know what i mean like playing your video game hopping on your iphone like these are things that like no matter what level of success you're at i feel like is applicable on all tiers of like the totem pole you know prepare yourself dude because when it comes you need to have the resources and the knowledge and wherewithal to execute and i think that's really important and then also very importantly the openness because one of the big mistakes i see a lot of people have is they're like like they have this plan and they have these exact steps on how to get to it and they're so narrow-minded on that plan that they don't see that like oh, maybe this exit is going to take me there 10 years earlier. And so I remember explaining this when I was in college. Like, I remember I was saying the same thing. Like, I know I'm going to be very wealthy. I don't know exactly how. And nor do I worry about it. All I know is that it is happening. And I'm already feeling like it has happened. You know, as soon as you feel like it's already happened, you know, all that. Uh, but the, 
But the issue is, like I said, when I dropped out, I had like one small connection in LA and I said, I'm going to be a realtor because he's in real estate. If I would have st stuck with that, I would probably just be another realtor in LA right now. But the fact that I was like open completely to look, I was looking for a location. I, it honestly boiled down to this. I didn't want anyone telling me what to do ever again. Yep. I was told what to do my whole life. I was the youngest, you know, so it comes right. from that. And so when I found out that, you know, real tour, you still have to like kind of take orders and all this. Maybe I can do my own thing. Thus, I was open to the digital marketing strategy. Thus, I was open to drop shipping. And that's how I got here today. If I would have just stuck to that original plan or the OG plan of just going to college, like you said, it, it makes no business sense to go to college and become more in debt what stupid like i remember this like literally made tears shoot out of my eyes a long time ago but when i was 18 i needed money so i made these pamphlets that said i'll rake the hell out of your leaves and then it was a picture of me in a suit with no shoes with the biggest rake you've ever fucking seen with a fish eye so it was like just just like what the hell is this like i just want to make people laugh with the pamphlet i didn't want it to be another boring like leaf removal pamphlet so i had it like this and I put these pamphlets all over. I skateboarded, it was like 10 degrees. And I got a call like almost immediately. This guy was laughing his ass off. He goes, hey, we just got your pamphlet. Me and my wife are dying. Do you think you could do the leaves tomorrow? I go, yeah. So I showed up and I did, all I had were uh, paper bags and a, a fucking like rake. And he's like, my yard is like two acres big. Like you're going to do it like this. I'm like, I mean, I got no equipment. So they let me use their equipment, yada, yada. Ended up being this multimillionaire dentist who gave me five referrals to, he said, listen, we're friends with all these people in Colombia. You go to any of these and say, I sent you, they're going to give you a job. And I ended up getting a job from that. Wow. But it goes way beyond that. So fast forward three years later, I'm, I'm talking to this one girl who still goes to Mizzou and I'm telling her this story. And she goes, whoa, whoa, this sounds really familiar. And I'm like, yeah, maybe you like see me uh, mention it before. And I keep talking, I keep talking. I show her the picture of the pamphlet and she goes, oh my God, Scott. I take an entrepreneur class at Mizzou and the teacher is teaching about you. And I remember I have that weird thing with energy. Right when I said that, the TV uh, paused, shut off, and my internet went down. And it was like, I don't, I'm not an emotional guy, I, would, I wouldn't say, but I literally, I couldn't even stop them though because it all came right. full circle. Right. It all came full circle. Like I dropped out of a school to become an entrepreneur and now they're teaching about me who dropped out. And it was, it goes back to what you were saying about how it doesn't make any bit, like, why would you go to a college class for entrepreneurship when the professor obviously wasn't a successful entrepreneur himself, or maybe was and wasn't, but I don't know if this guy teaching this class is the best person to, to listen to on that subject. If you want to be an entrepreneur and you're currently paying a student loan because you want to get a business degree, you are doing it wrong. Go to your college admissions tomorrow and drop out. Take my advice. I'm being so serious. I know 15 year. I know a 15 year old dude. He literally has a million bucks in the bank account. Like if that kid can do it, what do he make his money from? Drop shipping, bro. I know some crazy like, whoa. The guys in Asia, bro, and Singapore, are really crushing. I know like this group of Singaporeans. <laughs> probably not the right term for it but we'll just call them singaporeans uh dude these kids are nuts bro this kid's 15 years old has a million dollars cleared i know this like I, I wouldn't say it if i didn't dude that kid can do it anybody can do it that like even motivates me like i need to get up and like work harder i need to work harder i'm not working hard enough yeah sunday though i feel the exact same way like how much how much percentage of work ethic do you think you put in on like in like a year that you could but compared to what you could in in all honesty you want to know the true answer yeah because then i'll share my true answer too in the beginning when i was like when it first started clicking i never seen myself work harder and i haven't worked as hard as that as that first few months those first few months dude i was sitting in front of a computer 10 12 hours a day my roommate at the time dylan will vouch for this he'll tell you he would leave to work and he would come back and I'd be in the same position on my computer in the living room. I would not leave that sucker. If I could keep that same work ethic that I had for those next three months, I would be so rich right now. I would probably say realistically the amount of time during the day that I actually am productive 
in all honesty, it's probably 10%. Damn. Yeah, I'm honestly around the same way, 15%. If I'm being real, like if I'm really just quantifying like what I do in my day, like waking up, and it's pretty sad. And I and I got that office. I don't know if you ever came to my office, but I got an office and I thought like that would like force me into working, right? Like I'm paying like 10 grand for this freaking thing a month. Like, you know, I forced myself in this office. No, no, no. I worked, worked not as like worked less hard in that office than I do from my home. So it's one of those things that, dude, if we could max it, like, dude, me and this guy, if me and this guy right here to my right of me, man, if we could spend 100% of our time, <laughs> dude, oh. Eric, imagine that. Imagine you were productive 100% of the time. Look at you. <laughs> right. <laughs> dude, <laughs> no, yeah, you'd be way higher. There's nothing compared to the work ethic at the very beginning when you have nothing and you're just trying to make it work. When it hits so, the first so time. Hard. What about you? Hi hype raps? You feel like when hype raps first took off, you were like the best? 24 hour days. 24 hour days. When it yeah. just first starts hitting and you have nothing. Especially when you have a deadline. You don't even open the Shopify six months in. Right. Yep. <sighs> when you have that deadline, that like, this is a this is a disgusting story, but I was like the same way. I remember I had a certain deadline and I was working up to that, that whole two weeks, every single day, every single day and got to the point very, very bad where I'd wake up at like 8 a.m. and I wouldn't eat anything basically all day. I'd just have like a snack or two. But got to the point where I didn't want to like distract myself by going to the bathroom. I'd fucking piss in a water cup just like this and just pour it out the window. That because I didn't want I didn't want to leave that workspace at That's all. That's a crazy one. I pissed in bottles, but not for the same, not for that yeah, reason. It had to be it was <laughs> the wide mouth, the wide mouth ice mountains. Like with I the did the gallon. vitamin waters. The vitamin waters. You yeah, know my mom will tell you this shit was gross. Worst time of my life, pissing in bottles for six months. Oh, dude, I had to do that shit when I was driving Uber sucks. out here. No one wants to let you use your bathroom in L.A. Like Nobody. that's one, not one business. It's not like people who come here from LA, they're like, yeah, I'd love to, uh, can I get, can I like use your bathroom? No, you're gonna have to buy it. Somewhere. This fool is driving Uber literally in the driver's seat, taking a leak right before he yeah, picked somebody up. I had to, if it was a high surge, I couldn't be like, high oh, surge, go you couldn't compromise me. the surge, <laughs> you bro. You can't. 3X surge. I mean, what am I going to do? Go to the parking lot, wait for someone to leave their parking space and pull in and then wait for the, the homeless guy taking a bath in like the, the McDonald's bathroom to get finished and i can go in there and then the surge lost i literally just get like my water bottle go right here and then just fucking and then just like go off to the next it was that simple you hear this people my guy scott lives in a twenty five thousand dollar a month house he was pissing in bottles two years ago no excuses bro you know what i mean people make excuses all the time i make excuses to this day i made an excuse today not to work because it's sunday excuse yeah shame on me what I've come to what I've come to recently is that the root of most problems is invalid justification. <sighs> Repeat that, Eric. Invalid justification. No, the root <laughs> of most problems is invalid justification. Think about that. That's the root of most of my problems. You hear that, Alex? <laughs> Wait, what? Well, I called you Alex. Oh my God, bro! I called him, <laughs> Alex. dude. He looks like Alex, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah he's a real one he's, uh, it's just so funny sorry no you it's not where i thought it was alex for there a second you know alex right yeah you live and you learn no i know it's matt no i know dude matt come on he told me about you bro he was like yo get the girls ready matt's coming in <laughs> come on i trust me i know who matt is i just thought it was alex i just literally thought it was alex out of like my peripheral vision my bad matt Sorry about that, bro. Well, shout out Matt, the best model in LA. I'm getting all my gang. And if you need a car, hit on my boy Eric. <laughs> bro, no, for real though. This guy is flipping cars, bro, like a magician. Really? Dude, like Magic Jack, bro. He's just making them appear and disappear. Drop shipping cars? No, not drop shipping. I said, people used to drop ship cars. No, he's cracked the code. He's like one of those, dude, you buy a car for five, sell it for 10, 15, keep it moving. There's so many ways to make money. So many ways. I could give Ridiculous. you 10 ways to make money right now, guys. 10. I could give you 10. Let's hear your top three. My top three. I'll give you, I'll give you like, I'll, I'll just go on a rant. I don't know if top. You can start a maid business right now, right? Okay. So you have a maid, $10 to clean your house, Scott's house. Okay. I'm going to now charge Scott $15. I'm going to come the maids clean your house at $10 a rate. 
I can go print out flyers now and put them across the whole city. I have nothing. To, these are just maids that charge $10 an hour. But now I'm charging 15 And if you call my number, it's going to be 15 an hour. And then when they go clean your house for 150 bucks, I'm now going to make 50 bucks and pay them 100 That's my maid business. Scott and Luca's maid business. Second one, uh, obviously drop shipping. Uh, you could do what he's doing. Uh, he does many things. Is one of his like... He's a multifaceted Swiss Army knife over there. But one of the things he, he does is, you know, flipping cars. You flip cars. Um, you can do the, you know, get back to the basics. My first thing was flipping Supreme, flipping shoes. Like, that's an easy one if you're not making money. Uh, you can start Instagram accounts. Uh, you know, those some of those meme page guys make some good money. You know what I mean? <sighs> You'd be surprised. Um, obviously, you know, we, we can go... Dude, I can go days for days. It's just the art of the middleman. Like, yeah. think about how you can embed yourself from, like, one facet to the other and just weasel your way in there. Well, that first concept you're talking about, drop servicing, that's, like, very undervalued. Not a lot of people take super advantage of drop under, servicing. Dude, super undervalued. You can literally do that with, like, raking leaves or mowing lawns. All right, this guy, Jonathan, charges $20 to mow your lawn, charging you 50 bucko. It's about lead acquisition, getting the customer, and then, like, you do the rest from there. I'm going to film this video soon called making $300 a day with the Costco food cart. Ooh. So are you familiar with Costco's food mart? Of course. So you know their big ass frozen yogurt? Mm -hmm. $1.35. I've always had this thought. And I'm going to film this on Venice Beach. It's it's technically a little illegal because you need the, um, the food license or whatever. But I'm going to buy 100 of those, put them in like a cool down thing, and then buy like a big thing of like candy like little packs of candy. So I wrap each one. Total cost is probably $1.50 each, mm -hmm. if it may be a little bit more. So now they have the frozen yogurt and then the mix-in too, the candy. The M &M, they can choose the M&Ms, the Reese's Pieces, mm -hmm. but you sell them for $5. $5 on Venice Beach, so cheap. So cheap. But you're making over $3 on each one. You sell 100 which is so, you can do that in an hour. All you already made 300 bucks. Dude, I can't wait to see that video. I'll tell you another finesse I did when I was younger. When I was 14, 15, my mom used to go to Whole Foods. Uh, she was like, she was really not wise with her money, but like she like really wanted us to eat well. Like mm -hmm. that was one of her things. I don't know if it's like a cultural European thing, but like something about food is like you, like we can be living in like the gutter, but like we have to like eat like decently. You know what I mean? Right. Like, we, like that was just with her. That was her thing. Like if we're going to spend money anywhere, it's going to be on food. Uh, I mean, that's great for me, but she used to come back, bring the receipts, and I used to take the Whole Foods bag. And this was like, you gotta understand, like I was skateboarding when I was growing up. So like we were like really like making like pinching pennies, bro. I used to take everything on the receipt into the bag. And I only did this in dire moments because it made me feel really sus, but it hit every time. I used to go into Whole Foods, take the Whole Foods bag, take what was on the receipt, put it back in the bag, and then return it. It would only work if she had paid for cash and then they would pay me the cash back. So imagine this. I got my little skateboard. I got my little shit. Obviously, I couldn't do like, you know, $100 bills. But like when she spent like $40 at Whole Foods, I would go bring everything in the thing, take the receipt and then get the cash back. Wait, what do you mean by you brought everything in? Like you brought the actual food back? No, no, no. I would take the bag and I would walk back into Whole Foods and I would take everything on the receipt and put it in the bag. And so I would put all the goods back into the Whole Foods bag and I would take the receipt. Damn. <laughs> Dude, this is hustle, yo. <laughs> that is crazy. Bro, that's <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. Hey, I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> Y'all not hit, bro. So basically, you, you gotta do what you gotta do to survive. You're returning the Whole LA Foods streets. foods to them themselves. And at the time, I don't know if it still would, would work now. I haven't done it in years, but they would give you the cash back if you paid cash. Wow. It was one of my saving graces when I was younger. Yeah, we all have those for sure. A lot of memories would have not been made without that finesse. This is why he's looking at me like in a derogatory fashion, not you. Eric is looking at me in a derogatory fashion, right? Like almost looking down at me. You want to know something, Eric? I wouldn't have had to do that if you didn't shut my party down when I was 18. And check this out. Understand this. We, we got a little... He's got a little owning up to do. We're going to put this on the camera for the whole world to see. <laughs> Bro, 
I threw one of my first hustles was throwing shows and parties straight out of high school, right? Like, cause I was really tapped into the scene, like you know, again, like hip hop culture and like being like around this whole fair fat, like dude, like this is what we did. Like we were in the studio every day, like that it was like minus the days when I wasn't working. Like I was always like in like the studio with the homies, whatever it was. Before I came to the epiphany that I just had to cut everybody off, but we were throwing parties, right? Dude, we threw the most banger party. It was 8 p.m. We were charging like 10, 15, 20 dollars at the door. At 8 p.m., you're not supposed to have 150 people at your party. Like everybody oh knows your party con- like the people come at 10, 11, 12, like 12 is when things are really popping. We had 150 people in this party in Sun Valley in this ranch. It was not getting shut down for anything. The neighbors were coming with bottles of alcohol to come get turnt with us. Damn. It was nuts. This Muppet, I've known this Muppet for a while, bro. <laughs> this guy is throwing a party, a turned down freaking, it sucked, bro. He was throwing it in a Mexican cantina, like a, <laughs> like, a re- like, like a restaurant, low price. My price was better, bro. He paid like 800 bucks. I paid like 500 for mine. I got the whole freaking, I got an acreage in Sun Valley. Dude, this guy has the nerve to laugh, bro. The cops show up at 8.15. He's two miles away. His party is dead. Crickets, bro. You can hear a pin drop at his party. And you know what happens? I knew it was him. I, I, he denies it all day, bro. I know it was this guy. This guy calls the cops, and he shuts down my party in Sun Valley. I know it, bro, because there's only one person with the motive to shut down my party, and it wasn't the neighbors, dude. It wasn't. The neighbors were coming with alcohol and getting turned with us. There was no neighbors. You were in literally Sun Valley, bro. Have you guys ever been to Sun Valley? It's literally desert time. And this guy has a nerve to laugh. Bro, I would have made so much money that night. That night, I might not be here today if that didn't happen. Like, I might have been so paid off that party. I might have been set for life. Like, dude, 150 people at 8 p.m., bro. I was about to have 1,000, bro. That thing could have fit two, 3,000 people in there. Everybody was posting about it. At the time, like, the pink tank guys, like, dude, everyone was coming to that party. And this guy burned it. And you want to know what happened two hours later? No one was at his party. Everyone showed up. So I was at a Mexican cantina and left. No, bro. You were good. <laughs> Your party was sus, bro. It was run by like Armenian drug lords, bro. You know it. Damn. Dude. <laughs> no, they did, bro. Like I pulled up to his party. I was so salty, man. I was literally crying about all the money I had just lost. And this guy's over here with like five Armenian drug lords. Like, like he's like 17. Like, what is this guy doing? They got like pounds of weed in the back. Like, yo, make sure the kids don't come to the back. Cause like they'll get killed if they don't get the weed in the back. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm like, oh my God, bro. They're about to die going to the air party and i'm like think- <laughs> oh my bad hair <laughs> blurred is- <laughs> but dude, i'm just being real bro this guy has an i'm just saying you don't have that you don't have that you have some serious nerve to laugh when you're the person who put me in those situations he said you can't prove it. that's what he says can't prove it check the phone records like i'm some hacker he thinks i'm a hacker or something wow if I really wanted to, I could. The thing is, as I told him, I'll bet him $10,000 that he's the one who shut it down. I just know him. He doesn't honor his bets. I oh, whooped him okay. in basketball for $300 the other day. Literally acted like, like we're at the, acted like I, oh, like them, like I didn't school him on the court. Anybody wants to play me on the court, everybody in this room knows what the deal is. I'm the nicest person on the basketball court that has not made it to the league ever. Ever. Wait, so you're saying he still hasn't admit, admitted to calling the cops on you? No, and it's ridiculous. It's like, bro, Not come on. Same number. Same number. He thinks I can, like, bro, he doesn't admit it, but he knows because it's dishonorable. And once you, <laughs> and the thing is, is like, once you, this is like bro code, like, once you show dishonor, it's like he can deny the dishonor, and that's all he can do. And it's good because if he admitted it, everybody would know he's dishonorable. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting theory right there. Bro, I'm telling you, he just doesn't want, he's afraid to be dishonored. Bro, $10,000 cash. Please put it up. It's ready, bro. It's been ready. You got some hacker friends? Yeah, I mean, you can look up the phone records easily. It's easy. I know you did it. It's just about figuring out the night and like, I got to like literally spend a couple hours like figuring this out. And I just know he won't honor the bet. <laughs> <laughs> I know he won't honor. Here's to figuring this out. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's just my take on it. So he has no room to laugh at my conniving hustles on Whole Foods. You had some major conniving hustles for sure. Dude, telling you, dude, trust me. In these streets, these LA streets, being a young gun, <sighs> can't even talk about the stuff I've done. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Nah, it's back when I was younger, dude. Yeah. Dude, man, I mean, you do what you do. I learned from all my mistakes, and I made sure that every wrong that I've committed, I've made it right. Got to. Since my success. Dude, like, survival. People under underestimate that. It's Darwinism, baby boy. Like, bro, we're animals. It's the survival of the fittest. Like, I know that sounds like a little corny, but it's true. And how do you measure in our, like, with our species and our lives, like, who's the fittest? Unfortunately, it's money. Mm -hmm. Like who? That's how, right? I mean, <laughs> in most cultures, I'd say ninety-nine percent. I really don't know one culture that doesn't use money besides like those tribes. Yeah, and they use like other forms of money, like fur and like. <laughs> I thought of something really funny, but I just didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are funny, man. Yeah, I love my dogs. Yeah, my ex-girlfriend called the cops on me when i broke up with her for my party which was interesting because she, she uh, like there's only there's only like 40 people in my basement i was 18 and then the cops show up for no reason i didn't get in trouble or anything i just didn't answer the door but i was sitting with her at lunch because we we're still like friends the next monday and i'm like intuition strong like we we're talking about outside with intuition my intuition is hella strong hella strong something said there was something not right about those cops showing up i had everyone park whatever so i'm like hey can i borrow your phone my phone died i need to call my mom I look on her recent calls Not that anymore. night at midnight was a strange number for two minutes. I Google it, South County Police Department. And I and then I, I was so mad. I walked around the lunch thing. They were just watching me look Pacing. going crazy stories. What the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? And I was so I'm like, I'm never going to talk to you again. And then she ended up uh, taking like 60 Adderall that night mm. and then uh, tried to kill herself. So she had mm. to like. Had to get her stomach pumped and all that. Hey, crazy. That guy Scott's laying it down. No. He got his girl killing himself because no. he's breaking up. No. Hey. <laughs> hey, my guy Scotty boy. Okay. We got to get him linked up with the boys, bro. <laughs> Take him to the club. Come on, Benji. Well, we are, we're an hour and a half into this. Oh, my God. Dude, we've been quick. here for an hour and a half. Yeah. So S let's go ahead and wrap this up. Where can they up. find you at? Or do you want them to find you? Do we want to? I got to ask my manager. Do we? The people. The people watching this. If they could. If, his Instagram. Don't go with my Instagram. Don't, don't be DMing him asking for how to build a Shopify store. Asking for. Yeah, hit me up with some yeah. money opportunities. Like, yo, hey, Lucanets, I really liked your interview. Uh, I want to give you $10,000 because you're an awesome guy. <laughs> exactly. Now, that one. Keep those messages coming. Dude, that will pay you back tenfold. I'm telling you, anybody who throws me 10 grand just off of love, trust me. I'm a good guy to know, bro. I'm a good guy to like have a favor in like your back pocket. 10 grand, five grand, one grand, anything. Can I give him my cash app? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Luke and Nets on the gram and uh, Scott Hillsey on the gram if you want to follow this guy, which you obviously do. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll link it. I'll link it below. I'll link Thanks, it below. Guy. So before you go, I want to know what are your projections for what for 2020? What should people be looking at? What should they be keeping their eye on? Like just anything in general to find. It can be about money. It can be about happiness. It can be about anything. But what should people pay attention to most in 2020? Well, check out the new unhappy drop. <laughs> <laughs> the new hoodies are going crazy. And I know we're like totally like against the whole fashion stuff, but I mean, yo, bust down drawstrings. That's like, so badass. You need that. How did you get that domain, by the way? It's unhappy.com, right? $50,000. $50,000. I shouldn't have said that. Damn. Bleep that. We're, we're live right now. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of money. Uh, is that an, do you own it or are you leasing it? We own it. Good, because I know Sam Ovens is paying a ridiculous amount to lease his consultant.com domain. I think he's paying like a million a year to lease that. Dude, it's a great lease. Digital real estate. Well, anyway, back to your point. Uh, 2020, what can you look out for? Man, is this a rhetorical question? Are you asking me like, yo, what, do they, what are the people expecting from me? Or like, what do people like expect in general? I'm like saying life? when it comes to 2020... What mm -hmm. are your predictions for that? The people listening to this can apply to benefit them the most, whether it, it might be like a stock market drop or yeah, real estate yeah, market drop. That's great. Now, now, now your question is a little more clear. If Trump gets reelected, take all of your money and put it in the stock market. Yeah. I'm just letting it be known. Now the day he wins, 
which he's going to win. Uh, I just don't think Bernie's going to beat him. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bern. Good dude, man. Good dude, but you can't beat what... Say what you want about Trump, but we're in a really good position right now as a country. And if he gets reelected again, we're going to have a two-year bull market at least because maybe it might wind down right when he's like about to be out of office again because then he won't be reelected. But we're going to have a crazy bull market, bro. Two years of insane gains, I promise you. And again, I have to wait until he gets reelected because you just don't know. You know what I mean? But if he does, I'm taking all my money and putting it into stocks. That's some real shit. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? <laughs> oh, damn, for real. Dude. <laughs> like, no cap. Like, dude, take your hundred bucks, thousand bucks. I should be a couple of fucking, sorry, language. But yeah, you know the deal. That would be my 2020, bro. Take advantage of the economy. Take advantage. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Luca, for coming on here. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. And who knows, there might be a part two. Part two, baby. Let's right. go. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for watching. This episode is brought to you by Honey. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, dude, I was going to say. Can you imagine? I was like, he's getting a bat.